Four days of losses on the S&P 500. Will it become five as we kick off a brand new trading month? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Futures down seven tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. Goodbye, August. Hello, September. 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 We're buckling up. It will be a September to remember. You get the August CPI coming out in September. The September uh, Fed meeting on the 21st. QT doubling in September. This is going to be a big issue. The factor for not only repositioning portfolios, more broadly speaking, but how to think about it. The two-year bond yield is up to a high that you haven't seen since late 2007. We're going to see a lot of volatility. Does the consumer hold in in September? As the Fed destroys demand, what will happen to consumer is yet to be seen. Consumer sentiment has been absolutely abysmal the entire year, and spending has been fine. There is some sense that some parts of the, of the real economy might be responding to rates. I think we need to buckle up for September. I'm not going to blow up this show because Twitter has an edit button. We'll do that later. Joining us now, Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex, Daryl Cronk of Wells Fargo. They don't care about that. Katie, I care about this. This market's down for a fifth session. Do you want to buy it yet? Not yet. I have to be honest. This is what we've been predicting and thinking about since earlier this summer. We've been worried that the market was too optimistic and that the reality was going to set in. And that's exactly what we're seeing. That short bond trade continuing. You're still seeing also the strong dollar. Um, and really sort of the only thing that's changed direction has been the commodity block, which is really starting to show some recession type and demand destruction like activity. Daryl, you've said it. Peak inflation, peak hawkishness. We've got a new issue. It's about persistence the persistence of all of these themes. Walk us through it. Yeah, so I think it's more like uh, wake me up when September ends, John. I mean, let's just get through this month. I mean, you've got a number of key things. Seasonality is bad in September. It's the worst month of the year for the Dow and the S&P historically. You've got a well-publicized quantitative tightening that's doubling this month, which we know about. Also, which kind of flies under the radar, you know, buybacks will wane on us here mid-month because as companies go into the blackout period for Q3 earnings, you're going to stop the buybacks. And also, we expect a heavy dose of earnings revisions in the month of September as companies start to really mark down those earnings, which they've been somewhat uh, uh, resistant to doing up to this point. It sounds pretty brutal, doesn't it? Bank of America on the same page of Savita Subramaniam leading the team over there saying this. Jackson Hole raises risk for equities this fall as they still underprice policy risk. The Fed finding inflation through financial conditions means risk asset rallies both force and allow them to hike more aggressively as the Fed put has given way to a short Fed call. And Katie, everyone's on the same page with that. With that in mind, what does the data mean for the market? We've experienced good data this week, but that's bad news for the market. What is bad data? Bad news or good news? So bad news has typically been good news recently, but I'm afraid to say that bad news is not necessarily going to be good news going forward in the sense that it's clear that the Fed is going to hold their bearings and that we're going to have to see the fight against inflation. And I think this last week has really showed that the market finally has given way to that. And if you take a look at the curve, you can really see that inversion really accelerating recently as well. And that's something we're really focusing on. Will we see more inversion and thus more short signals in the bond complex going forward? I think so. The bond issue, Daryl, we've got to discuss. Yields up, yep. equities down, yields up, up and away over in Europe too. Can you tell me what you think is going on over there? Well, the data coming out of Europe is just nothing short of abysmal, basically. I mean, you saw earlier this week the Germany PPI at 37% year over year. Um, you know, the euro continues to fall, the, the pound sterling continues to fall. So Europe is just going to go through probably the deepest of the major developed markets recession, probably even deeper than the U.S., um, likely deeper than China, although China's data has not been terribly great lately. And so I think you've got to watch rates closely here. I mean, the two-year, the short side of the curve has never blinked, right? We keep pushing the two-year higher. We're as high as we've been since September of 2007 on the two-year. And I would just remind you, at that time in 2007, we were looking at earnings on a forward basis at 14 times, not 17, 18 times today. And you had a three in front of inflation back then, not an eight. 
This is what I'm struggling with at the moment on the yield side of things. We've got the two year back to about 350, just short of that level right now. I think we've all got to wonder if we've taken out the June 14 highs on a 10 year yield, on a two year yield rather, do we belong somewhere near the gene lows in the equity market? We caught it with Mike Wilson in the last couple of days on that. Take a listen to what the man from Morgan Stanley has to say. June probably was the low for the average stock. But the index, we think, still has to take out those June lows. The equity market is being too optimistic about the earnings outlook. And usually the way that resolves itself is the multiple will start to come down as earnings get cut. And then somewhere in the middle of that earnings cut process, the market will bottom. And we think that's probably sometime between probably September and December. Casey, would you go with that theme? Do you agree? I would have to say that I agree, John, in the sense that what we tend to look at is cross-asset themes. And I hate to say it, equities tend to not necessarily be as easy to time, and then what we look at is more looking at the cross-asset themes. And those cross-asset themes have been really, really strong recently. They had abated, but we're starting to see those themes really suggest that there's more issues coming and that equities probably will follow. Look at this long list of issues from Barclays, essentially saying there's no place to hide. Fears of tightening liquidity, driving a surge in cross-asset correlation. Katie's often talking about that. The tape is fragile with the fluid gas situation in Europe, mixed inflation data, weaker data in all regions, including China, and no central bank put strike in sight. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. It wasn't a good August, John, as you've been talking about all morning. Take a look at sort of the cross-asset picture. Stocks, the S&P, yesterday we ran the headline off about 4% for the month. The Nasdaq 100 off more than 5% for the month alone. Commodities, we'll call that about flat for the month or so. And then you did get further dollar strength. And a two-year yield that rises 63 basis points for the month of August alone. And that is part of the problem, John. And as long as I've been alive, you have people calling for the death of 60-40. But the whole point is when you take a look at the terminal chart, you want the equities and the bonds to be non-correlated, negative correlation. Because when one goes up, you want the other to go down. The problem with August is you saw both fall together and you got that positive correlation which again brings up people saying that they don't really like that 60 40 portfolio. Maybe we'll save that debate for another day. I think the big debate that you're having on this program is how we're thinking about September and the bottoms that we saw in June. Do we start to test those again? You just heard from Morgan Stanley, Jeremy Grantham, huge legendary investor over at GMO saying that he's looking for another big drop that the super bubble quote hasn't really popped yet. You've Jeff Gunlock tweeting about further yield curve and the stability of that signal and what that means for a recession. So a lot of signals coming that maybe we haven't sort of hit that bottom yet. Taylor, thank you. Brilliant, as always. Taylor Riggs there, just on some of the cross-asset correlations. Lou Wang of Bloomberg broke down August for us. Equities down, treasuries down, high-yield credit down, commodities down. You get the picture, don't you? Can I go over the month of August in foreign exchange and in the bond market in Europe? This is a snapshot of things over the last month. And I want to pay close attention to what's happened with yields and what has not happened with the currency. Yields over the last month on a 10-year in Germany up about 82 basis points, currency weaker. In the UK, the 10-year yield up by more than 100 basis points over the last 30 days, currency weaker. Sterling's just had its worst month going all the way back to late 2016. Katie, I want to come to you on this, and I want you to try and help me understand what's going on right here. Why are higher yields not supporting this currency? And are we starting to see an additional risk premium come into some of these bond markets because some of the extra funding these governments will need to offset the stress, the pain in the energy market? This is a really good question. We've seen this theme very strong this summer. The dollar has emerged the strong winner against other currencies because of relative positioning and, of course, the relative positioning for the U.S. to deal with things like energy dependence and other issues. And so we're continuing to see this theme that even though we're seeing rising rates, the relative effect on the currency is not as strong. I think it's something that could revert should we see the ECB start to move and actually create more pressure. But so far, it's really been a relative positioning story where the U.S. has come out ahead, despite the fact that everyone's fighting inflation at the same time. Katie, where do you think it's going ultimately? I'm not talking about some kind of sovereign debt crisis in Europe. I don't want to get too extreme just yet. But I want to understand the base case from you. Where do you think it's going? 
So in terms of currencies, I think the dollar has been so strong, there is some room for that to revert. I mean, if you look at it, it's at a 24-year high against the yen, and it's done really, really well. Um, so I would just say that there is some room for that to back off a little bit, and it's really going to depend how um, European governments and central bankers can react to their inflation problem in relative sense to how we are handling it here in the U.S., where it seems to be somewhat firmer. Kit Chu, to Sok Chen building on some of this, saying higher gilt yields aren't so helpful when people see them as the price the UK pays to suck in huge amounts of money. He goes on to say, the UK economy is in recession, the balance of payments is catastrophic, and more faster rate hikes won't do much to restore confidence. Daryl, whenever I talk about Europe, it's almost depressing. I said it earlier this morning, we don't need things to be great, we don't even need them to be good, we just need them to be better than expected. Daryl, how much worse can it get? Can things get any worse in Europe? Uh, unfortunately, I think they can get worse for Europe in the near term. I think the Germans are regretting right now that uh, Merkel gave away a lot of their LNG production, right, and fell reliant on places like Russia. Um, again, you know, the UK is really struggling. I agree completely. It's in a recession. Um, I, I think the challenge here going forward, John, is going to be how much political unrest. You've got a whole new um, cove of leaders across the Western European continent that weren't there when we put the Euro, the Euro together and the Eurozone together. I don't think it breaks apart ultimately, but I think it creates serious strain and stress in that zone, and the economics are going to keep driving it. A week of currencies over there this morning, that's for sure. Daryl Cady sticking with us. Futures down seven tenths of one percent. Let's get some movers going into the open. Here's Abby. Well, John, for four ninety nine a month, you can now edit your tweets. Well, maybe not you, but some users out out there can at least. Twitter is, of course, now trialing this edit function that's been debated for years. They have a premium subscriber. $4.99 a month will allow you to edit tweets. The stock's not doing all that much. In fact, it's down, so investors not thinking too much about that. Where we do have some real weakness, NVIDIA down 4.8 percent, fresh China lockdowns. 26 percent of the revenue comes from China. And, of course, the company also warned on $400 million of revenue relative to two AI chips that the U.S. would restrict the export exporting on fears around the military, the Chinese military using it, that they would have to be approved. So that stock is lower. Microsoft, big tech, lower in general as yields are higher. And we also have big energy lower, John. ExxonMobil down 1.4 percent. This as oil is back near $87 per barrel. Not a lot of good news. I don't know how you feel about that Twitter edit function. I'm more of a purist, but of course, Elon's poll supported it. We'll see how this goes. Can we expense it? The four ninety nine. Ah, that's an interesting question. Four ninety nine. Yeah. You we'll ask you ask management if we can expense <laughs> that. Abby, thank you. Coming up, China locking down another major city. These uh, uh, mobility restrictions are likely to have an impact on prolonging the economic weakness in in China, and that will have repercussions in the region, but also globally. Chengdu, twenty point nine million residents locked down. That conversation up next. We're looking at a, a U.S. economy which, in our view, is headed for a slowdown, Europe which is in trouble, and then the third big block, obviously, China. These uh, uh, mobility restrictions are likely to have an impact on prolonging the economic weakness in, in China, and that will have repercussions in the region but also globally. Global headwinds piling up, another major city in China locking down. 21 million residents falling victim to the country's COVID-0 policy. This coming as NVIDIA warns of a sales slump amid new U.S. restrictions. Team coverage starts right now. Bloomberg's Ender Karen in Hong Kong. Abigail Doolittle here in New York. Ender, I want to come straight to you, sir. 21 million people. What is going on here? It's the biggest lockdown since Shanghai, John. It's the first time we've seen a lockdown on this scale, by the way, over in Western China, too. It's a reasonably important industrial hub. It's known for auto production, electronics production, makes up about 2% of GDP. Also popular with tourists, by the way. It is a very popular panda sanctuary over there. Uh, and it speaks to the idea that China is just so determined, it's not letting go yet of this COVID zero strategy. We've had reports, plenty of footage on social media of of food rushes now, people scrambling to get provisions before they get tied down for the next few days as it undergoes mass testing. Next door to Hong Kong, Shenzhen also undergoing 
fairly strict restrictions. That's, of course, a key technology and manufacturing hub, too. So clearly all of this is going to weigh on China's economy. It will weigh on the industrial side of things. And it does show that China has a long way to go before it starts navigating away from its aggressive COVID-0 approach. And did the team at Bloomberg Economics say it's 1.7 percent of GDP? What kind of numbers are you thinking about going into year end now, just in terms of GDP growth and, for that matter, into next year? Well, people are kicking a ball around, say, the 3% area, Jonathan. That's where it seems to be heading. It's Their big investment houses are lowering their forecasts week by week. And you'd have to say when we get news like this out of Chengdu today, they're only going to put more pressure on those forecasts. As for next year, I think it's anyone's guess. It's whether or not a big policy pivot comes. We've got the Congress coming up in mid-October. That will dictate a lot as to whether China does pivot on real estate or on COVID or on something else. Fascinating trying to keep up with this. Abby, trying to keep up with NVIDIA in the last 12 hours, difficult too. Indeed, and the stock is down sharply at the lows yesterday in the uh, aftermarket. It had been down as much as 7 or 8 percent. And this, of course, on the news, the company warning that they could be vulnerable to losing about $400 million of revenue as the U.S. is now requiring them to have two different AI chips basically approved before exporting them to China. Uh, so this is, you know, not a, a huge amount of their revenue. It's a $30 billion revenue company, but it's not moving in the right direction. And then, of course, you have these lockdowns as well. 26% of their revenue comes from China. And, John, if you recall, this is chip giant. They pre-announced back in early August. They pre-announced by about 10%. Then they uh, reported last week or the week before it was a messy quarter. So they've seen some of this coming. Now, if we put this into the context of the broader picture, this stock had been up more than 1,000% from the 2018 lows. But this year, down almost 50%. So this company, investors are aware of these challenges. And, again, this slice of uh, revenue coming from from having to have those two AI chips uh, approved by the U.S. government before uh, being exported to China, the fear that they might use it in their military operations. It's a tiny slice, but it just really points to the tensions also between these two governments. Tensions in a big, big way. Avi, thank you. I've got to do a little there. And, of course, Senator Karen, too. This report came out yesterday evening from the U.N. I want to share some of it with you. That China committed, quote, serious human rights abuses. This U.N. report went on to say, as they looked at the detentions of Uyghurs and other Muslims in the Xinjiang region, that there was a broader campaign of rights violations that may, quote, constitute international crimes, in particular crimes against humanity. The assessment found, quote, patterns of torture or other forms of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The Chinese have responded. This is a response from Beijing. I'll show you their response. They said uh, these allegations were, quote, the lie of the century. The Chinese government, they went on to say, they called the report illegal, null and void. I mean, pretty depressing stuff coming out of China here. Daryl Kronk, Heidi Kaminsky, I want to bring you back in. Daryl, with all of this in mind, the cross currents around trade, the slowdown because of COVID zero, the allegations of genocide, what does it mean for how you approach that region at the moment? Yeah, I think you've got to be underweight China. I mean, China has thrown an immense amount of stimulus, as they always do when things slow down, equivalent to about 8% of their GDP already this year. More is absolutely coming, um, you know. But what is what is just crazy weak over there is the real estate market, the housing market, whether it's sales, prices, credit growth, any of it. And I think what doesn't get enough uh, attention, John, on China is everybody talks about the dollar versus the yuan and the strength the dollar's had. The yuan is strong against its major trading partners in the rest of Asia, which has really been abysmal for um, credit growth and exports there, right? And so. Exports are the lifeblood of China, and without that export, growth uh, is going to really struggle here. Katie, how can we make a call on anything, on commodities, on foreign exchange, on equities, on global growth, without a deep understanding, a decent view of what's going to happen with the world's second largest economy? How can we do that? Well, it's difficult. And I think uh, what we're seeing right now, the biggest area I would look at today is take a look at nickel prices, take a look at copper. These are commodities that are directly linked to something that was an issue for supply, and now it's a demand story. So I'd say that this particular narrative is really across multiple different asset classes, like we've discussed. So looking at the currency, but more importantly, looking at raw materials and where they're leading in terms of what to expect going forward and how big of an impact this may have on the rest of us globally. Katie, are you thinking about more onshoring? It's been a theme that I've heard said before on this program, heard you talk about for that matter too. Are you looking for more of the same? 
definitely the case right now. I mean, I think the biggest shift that we've seen is just a massive pivot in the commodity sector. So you saw earlier this year that inflation narrative being a long commodity signal, and now we're really seeing that demand destruction, that uh, negative signals in the commodity sector that's very consistent with cycles um, in inflation and cycles in prices that are very uh, destabilizing for companies and for uh, business. Just to round things up, Dara, when you see a lockdown of a city that large, are you thinking more of growth issues or inflation problems? Which side of it are you thinking more about, the demand side or the supply side? Absolutely the growth side. Um, you know, you, you've got the combination of basically Shanghai, Shenzhen, and now um, Chengdu locked down, which are the largest cities in China for COVID reasons. Um, you already had a struggling growth situation. What will be interesting here is what was noted earlier is the October 16th um, uh, party getting together, basically. and. And as uh, President Xi wants to go for a third term, he doesn't want a growth scare and he doesn't want an inflation scare, to your point. But the growth scare is real. I think at this point they've been able, because of declining demand, to keep inflation under control. And we would anticipate that's probably going to be the case for a while here. Darrell Kronk, thank you. Alongside Katie Kaminsky, coming up on this program, the morning calls, then later, Morgan Stanley's Dan Skelly, expecting stocks to keep moving lower. Are we having a little look again at the June lows? Will we? Before year end. That conversation coming up at the open and bow from New York. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell in New York City this morning. Good morning. Four days of losses coming into today, down about 5.8% on the S&P. Kicking off September with futures lower, six-tenths of 1%. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. First up, JP Morgan upgrading Baidu to overweight $200 price target, seeing upside driven by positive earnings revisions. Next up, Raymond James downgrading Bed Bath & Beyond to underperform, highlighting the company's sizable cash burn and abysmal business trends. The stock's down by more than 4%. That's a brutal note. Finally, Luke Cash Capital downgrading Hewlett Packard to hold $29 price target, expecting a challenging macro environment to continue weighing on demand. Their stock is down by 1.4%. Coming up, Morgan Stanley's Dan Skelly still looking for a bottom in this equity market. That conversation up next. Three seconds away from the open and bound in New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. We've gone over the losses over the previous four days. Down over the last four days by almost six full percentage points on the S&P. We're softer again. We're down six or seven tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq 100. We're down nine tenths of one percent on the Russell the small caps. Down almost one full percentage point. That's the equity market action. That's your open and bound. Switch up the border, get to the bond market. Yields higher. Jobless claims better. Claims a downside surprise. That's what you want to see. Maybe not what the Fed wants to see, and that's the problem right now. In the equity market, yields up. Six basis points in the bond market on a 10-year, 3.25 on tens. On twos, had a little look at 3.50 a little bit earlier on. A look at the dollar strength out there. Euro dollar, negative seven tenths of 1%, 99.85. Even with a long, long list of banks teeing up a 75 basis point rate hike next week on September 8th. Crude's lower by about two full percentage points, $87.72. 30 seconds in, that's the cross-asset price action. We're down about six-tenths of 1% at the opening bell on the S&P. Let's get you some movers. We can do that with Katie. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, it's already shaping up to be a bad day for the chip sector after the U.S. limited sales to Russia and China, of course, on security fears. NVIDIA did say that could cost the company $400 million in sales in the second quarter. NVIDIA got limited licenses for AI chip exports to China, but still a bad day for the stock, already down 5%, bringing down the likes of Broadcom as well to about 2%. Keep an eye on Broadcom today because they report after the bell. Moving on, you had Campbell Soup reporting earnings this morning. Sales were actually 6% higher on higher prices. That turned out to be a wash, though, because expenses jumped 12 percent that dragged down margins, dragging down the stock early this morning as well. And meanwhile, the job cuts continue. 
3M coming out cutting jobs to save cash amid high potential legal costs. This news, of course, hitting a day after we heard from Bed Bath & Beyond and Snap on their job cuts. But prices little changed right now, John. Let's just clear this up. NVIDIA. Not NVIDIA. NVIDIA. <laughs> NVIDIA? I don't know. That NVIDIA. might be uh, the I mean, New Jersey I, I, I accent don't know, a little bit. But I don't know. I'm trying to clean it up. Sounds well, better when you accent. say it. Sounds better. But I don't know if that's true, Katie. I'm not sure if anyone agrees with that. Katie, thank you. NVIDIA? Anyway, let's go with that. Just say it really quickly. Down about 5 or 6%. Abby's got more. Abby, which one is it? Uh, I've always gone with NVIDIA, so there we go. I'm not Done. sure if that's right. Done. But You and Katie win. Okay, well, maybe, but I don't know. I, I agree with Katie. It might sound better when you say it. But in any case, any way you say it, the stock is down sharply, down about 5.7%. And this is just a one slice of the weakness that we're seeing for chips right now. Now, of course, NVIDIA is down uh, for two reasons today. A double whammy. Chengdu, as you've been talking about, has been shut down. That's 1.7% of the Chinese economy. And they receive 26% of the revenue from China. So you have demand concerns. That's been a, a story for NVIDIA for some time now. They pre-announced an early August. They also put up a messy quarter. But then on top of it, what Katie was talking about in terms of the U.S. Uh, requiring approval for some of their AI chips to be shipped to China on security fears around the military, that's $400 million worth of revenue potentially. Not a huge slice of the pie, but it's more the direction, the tension. And you have these chip stocks under so much pressure. Over the last 10 days, the stock's losing 10 percent of its value on the year, down much more sharply. And why this is so important, John, chips, of course, the socks, it's a leading indicator. Chips are used in everything that we use today. So if you see a big slide here, it tends to lead the broader indexes. So really not a good sign potentially uh, for the markets and the economy overall. And if uh, if we see more of a slide, because of course it's not just NVIDIA, Seagate, Flash, Memory, they cut their third quarter by 400 million. Micron, that's NAND and DRAM, they see their third quarter coming in at the low end. And then City seeing, this is pretty bearish, 25% more downside for the socks and it's interesting because as you know John yesterday Jam Jeremy Grantham said that the vol yeah that volatility that we've seen this year it's just an appetizer to what could come that matches that pot potential 25 percent slide on the socks it could just be brutal if, from an economic standpoint there's so much bearish stuff out there I need a nice Marco Kalanovic note over at JP Morgan just to get my teeth into it talk about the bullish side of things for five minutes or so Abby thank you another slide here five days of it now five days of losses on the S&P 500 longest losing streak going back to I think July 14th over the last five days down about six and a half percent on the S&P and now about halfway back to the June lows mm -hmm. from the highs of August back to the June lows Taylor Riggs we're getting closer and I'm afraid that I'm not here to provide any of that positive uh, sort of information, John, that you wanted, because take a look at this terminal chart. And we showed this yesterday. So the big run up that we had off the lows of June, you were up 20, 25 percent. And then, of course, all of that cut in half. Take a look at the last two weeks. You're now only up maybe five, six, seven percent or so off the those big bottoms that we had. It's interesting when you think about the last two weeks. Some of this is a micro story. We still did continue to get a lot of some of the quarterly results. Dollar Tree, Salesforce, Match, NVIDIA, as Abigail was talking about. So some of that was sort of this micro sort of individual story. Otherwise, it was other some of those broad micro headwinds that we've continued to talk about. But those, of course, have been the stocks that have really been their hardest hit off of the peak that we had just about a few weeks ago. But don't ignore big tech because that's also where a lot of the declines have been coming down to. Big tech is down about a trillion dollars when you think about market cap, and it is the biggest of the big. It is a Nasdaq that continued yesterday sort of to be the big underperformer and on an individual level as well. That shows it all. There we go. Information technology down again today. And Taylor, thank you for that. We're down more than 1% on IT. Energy down about 2 percentage points. Crude a little bit sight, softer, lighter, lower, negative on WCI again today. All securities on the S&P down about three quarters of one percent. Got utilities firmer up by maybe a tenth of one percent. Call it two tenths of one percent. That's where a bit of our performance is. It's a difficult moment. We're down about five days again. Down five days for the first time since the middle of July. Wall Street with one question. Where's the bottom? The lead theme is that we end up retesting the June 16th low. The market will be hard pressed to really go too far below that at this point. Our belief is that we do not set a lower low. I think the lows are in. We have about a 60% conviction that we saw the low back in June. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if equity markets go down a bit further from here. That we're going to see a lot of volatility. I've been looking for about 3,500 and the SPX is the rock bottom. I think we will get through this okay. There's a good chance that we could see 4,800. 
not for sure that I'm waiting for that second shoe to drop. It will be a September to remember. The market will bottom. And we think that's probably sometime between probably September and December. Morgan Stanley's Dan Skelly joins us now. Dan, that was your buddy Mike Wilson. Just where is that June low? Jonathan, good morning. So we think we're going to test that again in the next, call it four to six weeks. And I'll just say it with a nod to American football season coming back in the next month or so as the calendar turns to September. My coaches 25 years ago used to tell me to keep my head on a swivel. And I think that advice is incredibly relevant in the next month or so. You heard some themes from some of your commenta uh, some of the commentators earlier related to seasonality and liquidity. Let me just add two incremental comments that haven't been mentioned thus far, Jonathan. First on seasonality, yes, September tends to be the worst month in general, but when you look at years in particular where the market was down leading up to September, the September average returns are actually even worse. And the second comment I'll make about liquidity, sure we have the QT risk coming up as everyone has talked about, but I think one development that hasn't been mentioned enough that Betsy Grasick at Morgan Stanley Bank's research has highlighted recently is that banks may also be de-risking balance sheets in the coming quarters to be more in line with Fed requirements on capital ratios. So that's going to add to the ambiguity in terms of liquidity. So you think it's like a pro-cyclical type feel that the economy turns lower and these banks have to tighten up and it just kind of feeds on itself, Dan? It, it, feel, it feels like we're heading in that direction, Jonathan, in order to be more aligned with some of these requirements, you have risk to capital formation. You have some pressure possibly on credit here and lending. And look, that's on top of what is this kind of unknown, this known unknown emerging with the Fed's balance sheet shrinkage. So Jonathan, that's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna be a multi-quarter development, but it's something to keep an eye on. So to your earlier introduction, you know, Mike was on a very lonely island earlier in January and the island started to become pretty overcrowded in June. <laughs> we had this massive rip hire, but we were cautioning people throughout the summer, uh, unfortunately, that this was a bear market rally, and that's what it's looking to be. Dan, dare I say there's no space left on that island. Everyone that comes on this program <laughs> is almost bearish all the time. You're not a perma bear, and I often remind people that you and Mike Wilson, in the depths of the pandemic in spring of 2020, were talking about a strong recovery in this market, and we got one. What would make you bullish again, Dan? What would make you leave that island, get on a boat and leave everyone else behind? Yeah, that, that certainly sounds fun, Jonathan. And, and I'll be sure to send you and, and the team a ticket as well on the boat. Um, but what I would, I would say is a number of things, right? First, we have to get some more capitulation in terms of the earnings picture lower, right? We've only seen 23 consensus sell side earnings off 2%. And look, the reality is maybe some of the buy side is already there, but we expect those numbers to trend over over the next quarter or two. So that's number one. We want to see a more reasonable and achievable level in earnings given this slowdown. The second thing I would say is, look, I think everyone is myopically obsessed with the Fed, whether it's 50 or 25, uh, 50 or 75, et cetera. I think folks were too optimistic on a pivot coming uh, earlier this year. Look, if we get a more dramatic economic pullback into the beginning of 23 and the Fed eventually does pause, that's a potential uh, additional condition to get more optimistic. And then lastly, Jonathan, it has to do with the global picture. I think, look, given the news this morning, given updated uh, lockdowns in major cities in China, given continued inflation pressures and commodities from the Ukraine-Russia stalemate, uh, look, the global pressures maintain a huge overhang over risk assets. And so were we to see any relief politically in those fears, that could also be obviously an upside surprise. Dan, a lot to unpack there, and let's start with earnings. Earnings is the big focus for you. You mentioned that a moment ago. Mike Wilson's been on top of that too. Earnings, in a way, have been flattered by what's happened with the energy industry. Energy earnings have been so tremendous. Where do you think the earnings risk actually lies? Where do you think that's going to be concentrated, that weakness that you're looking for? Where will it develop in the coming quarters? Really excellent point, Jonathan. And that is actually absolutely true. If you X out energy, uh, next 12 month estimates actually came down about 5%. So you're right, energy has really flattered the overall picture. Um, in terms of the risk, we're, ve we're very focused on idiosyncratic over earners over the, over the COVID pandemic period, right? So when you look at areas like metal, metal autos, semiconductors, these are some areas that had really unique um, benefits during that period where we're actually seeing not only costs continue to be higher, 
um, some geopolitical issues on supply, but demand now, right, and some of these issues cyclically might come under pressure. So those are some of the issues, some of the areas, some of the subsectors that had benefited in the last several years that may be at more kind of particular risk from, from margin degradation going forward. Dan, do you worry that you might be a little bit too early, just looking at the jobless claims numbers we've seen early this morning at 2.32? Do you worry that maybe actually this is a story for next year and not later this year? I think it's a fair point, John. I, I would just say, look, in terms of your whole dialogue earlier this morning, in terms of bad news, whether it's good news or, or bad, and I think that the takeaway is, look, when you look at the trends just this morning, NASDAQ and high growth stocks are still leading lower. And that's because the regrew of the stronger job uh, update was that the Fed is going to go 75, right? So the pressure on that high growth cohort reasserts itself. Um, and so that's a big deal, right? Because as you know, and, and everyone has talked about, growth is such a big part of the U.S. index that it makes it much harder for that U.S. index to, to kind of fight its way higher. So as long as growth is still kind of leading one of the troubled areas near term, it's going to be hard for the index to fight through that. I think this morning's dialogue has been utterly depressing. The first message I got about getting on that bullish boat was whether it would sink down given all the bad news we've seen. Dan Skelly's going to stick with us coming up. The job cuts piling up in corporate America. When I look at the payroll report coming out tomorrow for August, I would expect a significant slowing in the pace of job growth uh, versus uh, July. 3M, the latest firm to announce job cuts. That conversation up next. I'd be comfortable with some weakness in, in labor markets if we start to see uh, some job losses. But to be honest, we're far from that today. We're going into this with an incredibly strong job market. We won't be able to get the strong labor market conditions we had in the last expansion unless we get yeah. this inflation down. We can't just rely on markets. We have to get our rate up to the level that will put downward pressure on inflation. The employment costs of bringing down inflation are likely, likely to increase with delay as high inflation becomes more entrenched in wage and price setting. The data backs a lot of this up ahead of payrolls Friday. But looking at some of what corporate America is doing right now, you get a different picture. 3M the latest, joining a growing list of companies cutting jobs and telling Bloomberg the following. The business can't avoid this tough necessity, adjusting to the challenging macroeconomic environment. And this means job cuts. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. John, I'm curious if this is sort of trying to help us answer the question that you asked yesterday. How much of this is macro headwinds? How much of this is also a single company? Maybe some of that execution risk, similar to what we were talking about yesterday with Bed Bath & Beyond, right? Because, yes, there are some macro slowdowns, but there's also been some big legal setbacks for this company. I think a judge last week had said on a preliminary basis they couldn't use bankruptcy to avoid what could be 230,000 lawsuits related to some of the defects within those earplugs. RBI analysts were we're saying those settlement offers could be eight to twelve billion dollars in total. So there is sort of that push-pull narrative of the macro headwinds and then some individual issues affecting this company as well. I think what matters for our investors is you take a look at what has been one of the worst years now going back since 2008. You're off about 30 percent or so. So this is a company that, yes, if we think about a bellwether for the economy, also struggling when it comes to the share price as well. Uh, take a look, though, when it comes about job cuts. And I think what the economists are trying to sift through is you're getting some job cuts, but then you're getting jolts that are showing that there's still massive job openings. So what's the data that we look at? And the jobless claims, as Mike McKee knows better than anyone, shows that maybe things aren't so bad. So you tell me. And we'll see in payrolls tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Taylor, thank you. 298 is the estimate tomorrow for payrolls. The previous number, as you know, just blew up every single narrative out there. 528K was the previous read. Mike McKee's going to break it down for you ahead of tomorrow. Hey, Mike. John, let me expand on what uh, Taylor was talking about here. You take a look at the unemployment rate, and it is still way below where it has been on average going into recessions. It should be about 4.7 percent. That's the average since the uh, of the post-war year uh, years in terms of where unemployment is when recessions start. We are a long way below that. What is the Fed watching? Well, there are about 
70,000 people who are unemployed right now. At 4.7 percent unemployment compared to 3.5 percent now, that would be 1.5 uh, to 2 million additional jobs lost. But if there are 11.2 million job openings, as Taylor was pointing out, in theory, the Fed believes they could easily find new jobs, the people who are laid off. And so we look at what is going to happen tomorrow, and we want to see, and this is a little bit of a complicated chart, but let me explain it here. The number in yellow is the number of people who have lost their jobs. The blue is the number of, peop uh, number of job openings. And the white line there is labor force participation. And it has fallen dramatically since the pandemic began. That has to go the other direction direction to absorb people who are losing their jobs to get them hired. So far, it hasn't. So watch labor force participation tomorrow and watch the number of people who are unemployed. The Fed thinks that should rise. They don't think it will be a major problem because of the number of jobs out there. But none of that is happening yet, even though they've raised interest rates by 250 basis points this year. And Mike, what do you make of all this stuff anecdotally that we see from companies cutting jobs? making all these proclamations about what's happening with the labor force and then you see the data and we're looking at 300k tomorrow and claims this morning just look fantastic. It does look as Taylor was pointing out like a lot of it is sectoral or company specific. We're going to have to see broader job cuts that have to do with uh, demand falling before we really get an idea of uh, whether it is uh, a company issue or a major national issue. Is it execution or economic weakness yeah. or a bit of both and Snapchat may be a good example of some of that. Mike, looking forward to the ISM breakdown that you're going to deliver in about eight or nine minutes' time. Going to break down some of the price action for you right now, about 21 minutes into the session. We are lower by three-quarters of 1% on the S&P. Another day of losses on the cards here on the NASDAQ, down by more than one full percentage point with some of the sector price action. Here's Abby. Well, John, it is pretty brutal because we are, of course, as you were just mentioning, down for a fifth day in a row and down more than 6% on the S&P 500 over those five days. So that bear market rally clearly over has come to an end. And relative to sectors on the day, it is not surprisingly bearish, the theme of the morning. We have most sectors lower. Worst energy down 2.8%. This, of course, as oil is back below $90 a barrel on demand concerns as China has shut down another major city. Materials also lower. Information technology down 1.4 percent. To the upside, you have communication services up about six cents of one percent, and then utilities and healthcare, both defensive sectors, higher. So those two being higher is not all that bullish. The socks, though, that we've been talking about all day, chips, the socks itself on the day down 3.5 percent. And this is extraordinary. Over the last five days, starting last Friday, John, down 13 percent. And of course, as we were talking about earlier, this has to do with NVIDIA uh, and other companies struggling with both demand and those China shutdowns, restrictions relative to the U.S. and sales of some chips. One point I'd like to make, Citi is calling for that 25% decline. This index is already down 35%. That would be a 60% drop. And if I look back, the SOX in 2000 in that bear market down 80%. Four percent in the 2008 bear market, down 70 percent. That city call suggests that we might be doing something similar. So more bearish fodder for the day, John. So many bears out there at the moment. Abby, thank you for that. Abby went through the last five days on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100 over the last five days, down 7.5 percent. Off the back of this big move in the bond market, we add to it today. Not at the front end, though, at the long end. On a 10-year, after claims came out with a downside surprise, for me, if claims are delivering a downside surprise, I think that's the right kind of downside surprise. You want a decent jobs market. I know the Fed might be looking for something else. The 10-year was higher off the back of it by four basis points. Breached through 325, right now 323. The dollar strength that we're seeing at the moment, just slicing and dicing up G10. Sterling 115.65. That currency pair negative a half of 1%. You've got to go back to spring 2020 for these kind of levels. For the monthly performance we saw last month from Sterling, the weakest month, going all the way back to 2016. From New York, your trading diary. I'm next. Equities down. Here's the trading diary. ISM manufacturing at the top of the hour. Fed speak from Bostick, 3.30 Eastern. You hear from the president at 8 p.m. Bit of data coming up tomorrow. The main event is payrolls. Payrolls Friday from New York. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.